warm welcome to Wisdom from North. My name is Janneke and I'm now on my Wisdom from North tour around the US and I'm currently in Malibu visiting Barnett Bain. Now Barnett is a transformational uh, producer, screenwriter, coach, uh, magician of life and he is a radio personality as well. He has a radio show called Cutting Edge Consciousness together with uh, Freeman Michaels. And I really recommend that show. Uh, they're interviewing like big thought leaders and visionaries and uh, a lot of wisdom is coming out from that show, I think. And he is the producer of one of my favorite films of all times, What Dreams May Come. And you also might have heard of the Celestine Prophecies, which he wrote and produced as well. Now, Barnett, much, much welcome to Wisdom from North. I'm so glad we got to do this. I'm glad you're here. Welcome. Yes, Naka Ikenorsk. But you do. That's oh. it. But that's all I do. That's it. That was a surprise. I know. I saved it for you. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Howard Martin actually connected us. Uh, yeah, good because, yeah. Because I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow, and so thank you, Mark, uh, Howard. And uh, I'm so happy we get to have this conversation because um, you have a fascinating story. Um, a secret was kept from you in your childhood, and I guess that affected your life. Now, I would love for you to share that story and how, yeah, what it did to your life and your perception of it. Well, when I was very young, I had a visitor that came once or twice a year. He was, the, my parents told me he was my uncle. And he was a very strange man and there was also kinds of strange activity before he came. And I would get pulled out of school and put in a little tie and a white shirt, and posed. I never understood it, but he brought great toys. Always had many toys. When I was 12 years old, uh, right before my 13th birthday, I was alone in the house and I was going through all of the private personal belongings of my parents in their drawers, looking, snooping, investigating. And I found all sorts of mysterious stuff that I'm not supposed to look at. And I pulled out a document that said I was adopted and I had no idea. So that was my first experience of a story the power of a story, powerful because it was kept as a secret. I never understood the power of a secret uh, before. Um, and it immediately impacted me because uh, I thought, well, why would that be kept secret unless that meant something about who I was, that I was um, somehow defective or flawed, that there was something shameful about that. Otherwise, why would that be such a closely guarded secret? And so it's in my young mind, I didn't know really how to handle that. It shamed me. And then about five years later came the summer of love and lots of excitement and lots of experimentation and um, lots of um, illegal substances. And I was a young teenage boy and I experimented with that. And it blew open my subconscious mind and my unconscious mind in very um, uh, unple ways that uh, I wasn't prepared for, unpleasant ways that I was not prepared for. Uh, and up came a different kind of stories and a different kind of secrets. But these were secrets that we keep from ourselves, the secrets that I kept from myself, all of my deepest sense of uh, feeling not good enough, or bad, or ashamed, uh, or a wrong, or um, all of my unspoken, unacknowledged anger, and disappointment, and rage, and feelings of not being sufficient, and all of these things came up. And I um, got rocked, it absolutely rocked my world. So it was a different kind of story. Those two kinds of stories, the secrets that we keep, the stories we keep secret, from ourselves and the stories that others keep from us, they became the foundation for my life's work, which has been to be a storyteller and to unpack stories and meaning, to discharge the power in them, uh, and so that we can empower ourselves and other people. Uh, it's become my life's passion. And now, 
I discover there's even something beyond stories. Uh, so for a storyteller to have moved to the boundary of what stories can be uh, for us, what they do for us, how they create community, how they create connection, and yet there is more. There is um, a world of being, of consciousness, beyond story that is um, pure energy, resonance, frequency, pure, the language of frequency alone. We experience it, of course. We have moments of being tapped into the exhilaration or the disappointment or the excitation and anticipation or the helplessness. We go back and forth before we even put it into a story. We can feel that in our bodies. Uh, so there's a whole, there's a whole dimension of experience that is imaginal, that we tap into uh, emotionally um, first. I'm sure it, it plays out in all sorts of other areas too, but we take that and we pour it like inside of a funnel, make it smaller and smaller and smaller. We take the all that is, the pure energy experience, and we pour it in smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it's condensed into time and into space and into logic and into reason and into facts. And we string it together like pearls on a necklace, one after another in a straight line so we can make sense of it. Huh. And we call it a story. Hey, we do that at night in our dreams too. When we're dreaming, we're not really in the same kind of idea of time that we have. And where are we when we're dreaming? I don't know. We are outside of the love affair with the straight line that we have usually. <laughs> we, are, we are tapping into the parts of ourselves that are already functioning there at the top end of the funnel, towards the top end of the funnel, not at the bottom little squishy part, uh, which is even outside of logic and outside of reason, outside of time. You know, in dreams, sometimes time is very strange. You walk into a door, and it's three years ago, and you turn around, and it's five minutes in the future. And, or sometimes there's no sense of time at all. There's no time. And or sometimes I can go to sleep and have a dream, and it feels like it was years, and then I'll wake up, and it's not even two minutes. Hmm. So we are outside of time, and then in our daily lives, we take that experience or even the dream experience, we wake up and it doesn't really happen and then and then and then and then. We know how hard it is to tell a dream. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult because it doesn't line up in sequence, but we do our best to line it up and make it straight. And we call those stories. The bigger picture uh, is a much looser sense of stories. So as a story maker, I've spent my life um, exploring that and sharing that and now exploring what is after stories so when I'm, I'm going well, back was a simple question. <laughs> yeah. <So did> I. <laughs> well there are never simple answers or I don't know it was a simple um, question <laughs> yeah, it was a simple answer. <laughs> but I, I want to backtrack a little bit uh, when you were in that state where uh, you know you were exploring these things how uh, you're a coach today so how did you work on yourself to uh, change your life to accept all these things that you found in yourself I had a lot of help um, as long as I as far back as I can remember I felt connected to a bigger idea of what than what I was being told that life was. I felt connected to uh, a reality that didn't really make sense mm -hmm. in terms of logical thinking. I knew even when I was from the time I was very small that life was not happening to me, mm -hmm. but that I was in a dance with it and that I was a co-creator with it. I always understood that, not mentally, but I always understood that. And so all along the way I have had uh, uh, the great gift of 
being supported in the unfolding of that and in the deepening of that with my friends, with people who have become teachers. Um, once when I first came to Hollywood a long, long time ago, I had a job uh, writing a movie and I had terrible writer's block. This is back in the day, no computers, yellow pads, big desk. <laughs> and I would sit there and I couldn't think of what this movie, I couldn't think of anything. And one day, uh, my wife came down to my office and I was sitting under my desk. Uh -huh. under. <laughs> okay. I thought, and I said, I, this is really not good. And I went to a, a therapist. I had friends that were writing for a television show for Saturday Night Live. Oh. They're a couple, a writing team, and they, had, they said, you should go see our, our, our therapist. We go um, because we're a writing team and we fight. So we, we go for couples therapy. We're, not, we're just writing team. <laughs> and so we go twice a week. And then uh, we each separately, we go, I go one, one of them goes once a week by himself and once a week with his wife. And so did the other one. So there's six hours. We'll give you our six hours and he'll help you with your writer's block. So to make this story short, I did... Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I don't know how long you're. <laughs> we have with time. Us. We have Please time. Stay with us. This will get interesting. Um, I went there. I took all six hours, and I wrote this entire movie in the therapist's office. And every time I would get stuck, he would begin to work with me, and I became. I just fell in love with this guy. He was. Um, I was young, and he, you know, I thought he was very, very old. He was probably about my age now. But, um, <laughs> um, perspective. <laughs> it is. It's all perspective. It's all the point of view. So after we were finished, I continued on with him. And I finally, I delivered the movie, and I continued on with him. And one day, um, about seven, eight months later, he said, I am not going to keep you in the same sort of relationship. I want you to understand that there is a much bigger game going on, adventure going on, than psychology. And psychology is a grain of sand on an infinite beach called spirituality. And so he introduced me to a formal study of spirituality and metaphysics. And for that, I am so grateful. I am so... Um, deeply appreciative. I so love him. He's probably 90. He's, I, I went to his 90th birthday, so he's probably about 94 now, 93. Mm. Um, he's a wonderful man. And um, I've always had the benefit of those kinds of, that kind of support that just arises. The Buddhists call it a response to spontaneous right action. So the, mo the more that we can be in the present moment, the more that we can show up and make choices out of our character and values, and we are met right where, right where we need to be met. It's as if the road rises to meet us. As my foot steps to the ground, it's like the whole of the world is invented right there in order for it to meet the footfall. Uh, and so I've always managed to sometimes stumble along and sometimes with more confidence uh, to be supported by, by that. But I'm thinking uh, that it's, to me, not, I'm thinking now that you asked for help in a way, that we you don't... have to ask, always have to ask. That's a good point. Yeah, that we don't always need to uh, fix it ourselves, you know? We have to maybe come into that vulnerable state where we're like, yeah, I need help, and we are helping each other. We don't need to go the path or walk the path totally alone and fix it ourselves, necessarily. And we can't. So it's a big lesson to come to the understanding that um, we can ask. And when we ask, we are always answered. But we... The sometimes we always get what we want, always. We don't always get what we ask for, because what we ask for is not always 
what we want more deeply. Sometimes we have agendas under the table behind my back. <laughs> I say I want this. I say I want, um, I know people that come to me sometimes and they say, um, we well, would like to be in the movie business. And um, that's what they ask for. But what they really want under the table is they want to be famous or they want to make a whole lot of money. So I say, well, why don't you just make, say I want a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then however the universe will support you on that, if you're in alignment, you may have other things that you, you may not even be clear on that. You may think you want a lot of money, but really you want a lot of money because you want to prove that you're not, def you know, that your teacher mm -hmm. in the fifth grade was wrong about you mm -hmm. or your boyfriend was wrong about you or, mm -hmm. you know, what it requires some um, arc, what do they call those people who go to like Egypt? Archaeology. It requires a little psychic archaeology <laughs> to understand what you are really asking for uh, and then to ask for it. And you'll always be met. You'll always be met. When we're small, we come into the world and um, our relationship with the world is uh, from a perspective of what happened to me. I was born into a situation. Um, I, I didn't feel that I got enough love or I felt I got too much love. I was smothered or I felt <laughs> that, you know, I didn't like the food or <laughs> You know, um, this happened to me, and that happened to me, and this happened to me, and that happened to me. When we're small, things happen to us. Mm. And then um, I call that, um, you know, this, I call it the first story of life. And then, then we have, uh, this is something I've come to after years of being a storyteller. I realize there's only three stories. Okay, what are those? <laughs> the first story is this story of, this is what happened to me. Oh, they were mean, or they gave me everything, or, or I cried and nobody came, or I cried and they, they never left me alone, so I cried. Um, this, and then I grew up and uh, I had the wrong politics, or the, I lived in the wrong culture, or they voted the wrong person into office. I call that the first story, what happened to me. And then we grow and we mature, we season, we be, develop understandings. It comes as another story, the second story, and that's how I fixed the, the first story. I studied hard. We're taught that in the world. Study hard, study hard, and that's beautiful. You know, study, work hard, and I got the job. I learned how to, um, I learned how to run my shop, and I, or I learned how to fix the car, or I learned how to uh, run the camera. Um, I married the man, I got the girl, I lost the weight, I got the job, I'm fantastic. Um, you know, I be, in this country we call it the American dream story. And all over the world, people are still aspiring to this second story of the American dream story. If you get it all right, you can, um, by your own, you fix yourself enough, by your own accomplishments, you can triumph in the world. And that's a beautiful story. But there's more. There's a third story. When you, um, first story hel is a story of helplessness. I don't have enough, I'm not enough. And the second story is a story of um, triumph with its many, many beautiful lessons. But then comes a third story of who we really are. It's a story of, I'm enough. I'm not broken. I'm not trying to fix. I'm enough. Who am I really? Who am I really in relationship to you and to you and to you and to you? What is my destiny self-chosen? If I died tomorrow and on my grave it said he was a film producer, really? It's fun, but really? <laughs> um, the third story is 
this destiny that is not given to a, a world that I'm not a part of. It's self-chosen of what am I really here to do in this life, to be in this life. How am I here to be a light and to shine that light into the world? How can the world be different as a result of my involvement? What am I here to give and to be? And that story is the big story of contribution, you know, to love, um, to participate, to lift, to make a difference. Um, Do you think we need to move through these two stories to get to the third story? I think so. I think, um, you know, you s s when I look at this table here, which was cut from um, an oak tree that was fell by in a lightning storm not far away from here and um, they cut it up and but there are here these growth rings there's a ring and another ring and another ring so I think these stories are growth rings when we're small this is the ability this is how we are able to process life we have a little more experience and a little more seasoning a little more growth and now we grow into, we process life differently. So first, you're a child and am I getting enough? Am I getting enough? Am I getting enough food, enough attention, enough warmth, enough clothes? And then I grow and I grow. Now it moves all of a sudden. Am I good enough? Am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I fast enough? Am I fit enough? Am I talented enough? Am I beautiful enough? Am I handsome enough? I mean, all of these things. And then we grow and we grow and we grow again. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we stay there. Mm. We grow again and now I, I'm a, I am enough. Once I am enough, the whole thing changes. Nature is not operating. If we go outside to the sea or across the street to the mountain, those rocks, uh, those fish are not wondering if they're good enough. Mm. They're not operating in the same way. Uh, they, uh, they are enough, and they're working in a synergy of a nature that is one of the beautiful gifts of living in a place like this in nature, where I am reminded when I go out into the world every day, when I look out the window, I'm reminded that the entire of the universe is functioning from a place of being enough and that human beings set themselves out as a beautiful growth experience, as a beautiful adventure, to say, what if I thought of myself as separate? Hmm. What, would be the, what would that be experience be of pretending I'm separate and creating an entire evolutionary, human evolutionary arc just so consciousness could experience itself as being separate. I'm not getting enough. I'm not enough. Mm. And now we're at a time in the evolution of human history, 14 billion years, I guess, of... <laughs> we're here now. To, to, to realize, to be able to say, we're here now. <laughs> mm. To be able to say that. Uh, and what that means is I am enough. Individuals are coming into that awareness and communities are coming into the awareness, and it is the movement of consciousness on this planet. The planet itself is mm -hmm. moving in its own experience, but in the, at the human level, it is a, in some ways, I see it as a understanding of I am enough, and then what? Now I'm not trying to fix. Now what? But is the veil really getting thinner? Because I heard you said somewhere that we're kind of lucid dreamers now. And you also talked about that before we had gurus and everything, teachers, but now we're kind of our own gurus. So that's my interpretation of what you said. Um, I still have people from whom I have much to learn. Uh, and we all have the benefits of being able to be inspired and to develop uh, personal mastery as a result of our exposure to uh, others, whether they're in the body, they're not in the body, 
who um, who are who have a, some more growth rings. <laughs> uh, the difference is that in that second story of am I enough? Am I good enough of fixing? Inside that story, um, sometimes, certainly, uh, certainly in my own experience, sometimes I can look back and see where I found a guru or a teacher, whether it's a spiritual guru or it's a, uh, it's a professional guru, uh, somebody that, you know, in my business, what, I know yours as well, uh, agents and managers, <laughs> right, and casting people and... Um, they're going to fix it. They're the gurus, you know, just please, please. So what happens is uh, it is very easy inside that worldview to give away power to somebody that we uh, think has more uh, power and can do it for us. Mm. That's different than what can I learn mm. that will empower me more than to give away power to say, I need you. So um, it's a subtle difference, but it's a profound difference. And so the idea of a guru often is, a, um, is an unequal relationship uh, in which um, a, a seeker gives away their sense of power and feels incomplete without the teacher and that's a, that's not a healthy that's not a healthy sign so the mark of a really in, in, this is all personal so take everything i say with a grain of salt but in my own experience the mark of a really um gracious a really beautiful uh teacher a really beautiful spirit is that they extend their wisdom they support they extend their love um they want to uh, help others to become more of who they can be and are very clear about the boundaries. I, uh, I know the, I recognize it when somebody says they don't want you to become uh, a supplicant. Uh, when somebody says, we're not your father, we're not your mother, um, we are not in that sort of relation. We are friends. That's a different relationship than um, a guru mentality where people have devotions. So it's subtle. Do you think we have all the wisdom in ourselves that uh, as when you work as a coach uh, that you're kind of trying to uh, have the other person understand what it's, what's inside themselves in a way? I think we have the potential. We all have the potential inside of ourselves. Um, in Hindu mythology, and in a script that I just wrote, that's why it's fresh in my mind. <laughs> so <laughs> there is a there is a story about the god um, Indras. And Indra, do you know it? Indra had a, a net, a fisherman's net. And this net um, went on infinitely. And into the cross weave of, on that net, at every place where the weave crossed, was stitched a beautiful pearl, infinitely. Now, the amazing thing is that in every pearl, was the reflection of every other pearl in the infinity of the net. So you have this amazing 5,000-year-old image of holographic reality, of a hologram in which every single individual piece is separate and unique and its own thing, and inside of which contains the uh, information to recreate the whole thing. So, to more directly respond to your question, 
inside you, inside me, inside every cell of my being, inside every cell of your being, is enough information to recreate the entire of all that is. Mm. Do I have access to that? No. No? No. I don't have access to that. Really? Really. <laughs> so sometimes we hear people saying, you know, I am God. Mm-hmm. That's a head trip. I don't know myself to be God. I barely know myself how to get from here into town without breaking the speed limit. <laughs> so, so um, what is more true for me is that, and when I'm working with somebody, or somebody is working with me for that matter, is that if they're gifted, they will um, bring from me, they will bring me to the edge of my capacity. They will open me up to a discovery of gifts and talents that I can nurture and cultivate. You're an actress. You studied at the very famous circle in the Square Theater, John Hussman's theater that he founded. You know what it is required to become uh, good at something. You know what is required to become great at something. Does everybody have those gifts? Uh, To become great? Yeah. Can everybody become Meryl Streep? Uh, No. I I, I don't think so. Right. (laughs) (laughs) We have different talents. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And a gifted teacher or a gifted coach um, can guide and can support um, another person in developing their unique gifts and their unique talents. Uh, One piece at a time. It takes a very, very long time, a lot of attention and a lot of focus to become a wonderful actor. Mm. It doesn't happen in five minutes. It requires mastery. Mm. And so a a great coach uh, helps another person, helps a client to discover what is beautiful, good, and true in them and helps them uh, support it and creates for them, co-creates with them a structure, Mm -hmm. an environment in which energy is directed there, attention is directed there, energy uh, follows attention, um, helps bring to uh, the other person some tools, some skills, uh, some ritual, some support in order for them to become more of who they can be. Mm. And more of who I can be is a work in progress. If I, if I presume that I am already everything, I don't even know what that means. I don't have an imagination that extends to that. Um, but if I am supported in operating at the very edge of what is possible for me, then some things come up. The first thing that comes up is resistance. Yes, always. Always. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's the first thing that comes up. Uh, And so a great coach or a great teacher or a great acting coach or a great life coach or a great creativity coach uh, understands that and is ready for it and um, is providing a mirror like a good director does uh, and order and the tools so that... uh, so that you're not alone in dealing with those resistances and you know they're coming and you know why they're coming. We have a certain identity about ourselves. We understand ourselves even if we're not, com- even if, we're, it, if it's unpleasant, it's familiar. And so if suddenly um, I move to the edge of my beliefs about myself, my thoughts about myself, my choices, my feelings, my usual patterns, and I move right to the edge of them. And then you say, go on, Annika, come on, come on, come on, come on, go. And you stumble across. Now I'm right off my map. I don't know the territory anymore. So what comes up uh, is 
all of the all of the inner, littler growth rings, they all get triggered. Am I going to survive? Will I be humiliated? Will I fail? Will I lose my security? Will I lose my job? Will I, will I get stage fright? Will I choke? Will I, all of the horror stories mm -hmm. that we bank in our subconscious, they bubble up. And they need to come up. They need to come up. And in, with, a, with a great... Um, with enough tools, whether you get them uh, wherever you receive those tools, with enough tools, um, one learns how to manage a relationship with what comes up. One learns how to open the strong arms of the goddess, the feminine energy that is the womb. You learn how to identify yourself as the womb that can be pregnant with something that is emerging. <laughs> that can hold that. That can hold that. It can expand to hold that. It's not necessarily, it's not comfortable because it's not familiar. You learn how to be pregnant with what is possible. Um, the unknown. The unknown. And the infinite, maybe? It is the infinite. Mm. The unknown is the only thing. Once it's in form, it's, this is a microphone. <laughs> So once it's collapsed into form, I can relate to it. Now, if it is potential microphone, whoa, I don't know what happens. So we're living in times that are very, very chaotic right now. Okay, so chaotic. Talk more about that. And the reason they're so chaotic is because once upon a time, um, everybody's beliefs about what was possible and everybody's choices, they were very, they were more simple Time seemed to, well, it didn't just seem, it moved much more slowly. There was a different energy, underlying frequency of, of aliveness and growth. And that is, uh, for many reasons, one of them which is, has to do with the evolution of humanity. Um, so as you get, you know, when you look at children as they grow older, uh, the lives become more complicated, more filled with, um, more filled, first of all, busier, um, l less straightforward, and there is m um, a much more um, complex relationship with life. So that is what has been happening on our planet. Uh, and with those complexities, people have begun to explore in their own unique ways that are not the same as in times gone by when more people did fewer things and in the same way. Do you know what I mean by that? There were certain kind of religions that most people practiced in a very straightforward way. There was, in this country, three media, electronic media outlets on television. There's now thousands. And the internet, and we didn't we didn't have all of these um, avenues that allowed us to begin to develop ideas, thinking, feelings, choices, beliefs that were not so that were it, that were once upon a time much more organized and much more coherent. Everybody went to the same school. Everybody got the same news. They got it at the same rate one newspaper every 24 hours, there's only this on it. Mm. Things just move so quickly now that people are now evolving and growing in their own rates and in their own ways so quickly mm -hmm. that it creates more, diff more energy waves and more frequencies that, again, like the ocean where all the little waves, they intersect and they fall back on each other, and it looks like a calamity when you look at the, the, the tops of the ocean, all the waves. And, so all of those waves are energy frequency. Where once it was a more calm surface, now it's much more alive. Um, that creates chaos. Okay. Chaos is resolved when all these waves are potential form. A wavelength that is traveling from your microphone to your camera is 
information, energy in a formation, in formation, <laughs> that is not realized until you plug it in and you bring it up on the screen and there's a picture of you and I. It's in potential until then. The only time um, energy ceases to be in potential is when it shows up in form as the picture, as the microphone. So the more wavelengths that you have that are not shown up in form yet, the more chaotic things are. So if I have a wavelength like this and a wavelength like this, they pass through each other, it seems chaotic. But if I have one and they hit, then a wave forms and it rolls to the beach and it breaks. A wave forms and it shows up as microphone. The frequencies of microphone comes a standing wave. Once it's a standing wave, it shows up as form. This is, I, I hope this is making some sense. Yeah, but how do we navigate in this chaos? We learn to allow these things to pass through us. Okay. So we experience them. I've been using these, these terms. They're, they're um, raw materials of how we, allow the, how we allow ourselves to deal with life. These, these potentials, these energy potentials that show up as waves, we experience them as six raw materials. Our thoughts, mm -hmm. our beliefs, our choices, our decisions, our attitudes, our feelings. When we allow them to arise without, we don't have to believe everything that goes through my head. I don't have to believe every thought that I have. I don't have to react to every feeling that I have. Uh, I can simply be in the present, in the moment, and aware. I want to become conscious of what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what I'm choosing, what I'm deciding, or not. Hmm. I just want to be conscious of the potentials, the energies that are moving through me. All of these things are energy motion, emotion. Emotion is energy motion. I want to be aware of, of it that energy moving through me in those in those six ways mm -hmm. and if I'm aware of them I can choose which ones I want to make real I make real by putting a, attention giving them dimension giving them my time mm -hmm. giving them my space if I keep giving them my time and my space I'll make them real have you ever gone to a family reunion and you've been around with people and you're talking about like Christmas from 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and everybody has a different story. You think, hey, was I really yeah. there for that? Right? <laughs> so. That's or, interesting. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. Yes, you were mean to me. It wasn't yeah. like that. So after 20 years, you know, somebody is still giving their time and their attention. They don't remember anything that happened. You do, do we remember everything that happened in the last 20 years? Well, our subconscious remembers everything. Mm -hmm. But consciously, do we remember everything? We only remember what we give our attention to, what we give time, energy, and space to. Mm -hmm. We make that real. So out of all the 20 years, we all have the relatives that hang on to the moment at Christmas dinner. Mm -hmm. And then in my own life, there are certain things I'm going to be 60 years old next week and yet there are still certain things that I hold on to that I can remember from being very small um, that I give that I give energy that I give time and that I give space to I give energy to and so out of I out of all the things I could remember there's this handful of things that I make real and we do that and some of them are beautiful and some of them I would be well served to let go we do that uh, at every moment. And as we become aware of those six raw materials, um, and we don't necessarily give that, we, we acknowledge them, we recognize them when they come up. Uh, sometimes they need forgiving. Mm. And then we release them. We let them just move through. Mm. That's how we don't get hooked in right. to the craziness 
We, uh, we just are in the chaos of it. And in, if we can do that in the chaos without getting hooked in, it's a very powerful, beautiful place. It's a very powerful, powerful, beautiful place out of which all creativity and innovation arises. And then we make those six raw materials. We work on them with three tools in order to create our reality. Desire mm -hmm. and expectation and the one common sense that we all have that holds it all, which is imagination. The one sense that is common to every human being, to everything. The real common sense is imagination. So our desires and expectations. Should we really desire and expect things? Isn't that like to uh, uh, form it in a way? Ah, I want it that I way. I love that question. <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> We're always I want desiring. it my way. <laughs> no, we are always desiring. So sometimes, sometimes I hear people say, well, it's not good to desire, so I'm not going to desire. I say, really? So um, <laughs> isn't that a desire? I'm trying to be a spiritual person. I don't want it's to right. desire. <laughs> but that's a desire. I'm not going to desire, so I'm going to desire and not desiring. I have to put attention to that. I have to give it time. I have to give it space. I have to give it my energy. In order to, I'm not going to desire anything. That's a, that's a big commitment. <laughs> yeah. You got to desire that really <laughs> strongly yeah. to feed that. That's true. That's a desire. There is not a. There is nothing on the planet. There is nothing um, spiritual about denying desire. What is unhelpful is to be attached mm. to the form. Because forms pass. But that's the expectation, isn't it? Uh, no, but we'll get to that in one second. <laughs> um, expectation is a... For, for, to finish with desire, because the expectation connects. I desire... I desire to have a deep conversation with you. I desire to be present with you. I desire to know you and to see you. And as a result, we're having a really good conversation. You desire similarly, and so we're having it. Would you, if you were not desirous of this, it would not have happened. We would never have come together. We wouldn't be sitting here. Nothing creative is ever generated without a desire. And there's nothing that we do that is not creative. Sometimes people say, well, I'm not creative. No, did you wake up this morning? You created that. Did you manage to um, brush your teeth? <laughs> you had to create the intention and then the follow through to do it. Not every act is, um, is a creative act in the sense of, well, I'm going to uh, write a symphony or invent a circus. But there is no act or no choice that is not creative. Uh, creativity is love's work. There is nothing else going on in the universe. So the whole universal impulse itself, the whole God expression, is love's work. That is a desire mm. to express. Mm. Nature <laughs> is desiring to blossom. Mm. So expectation, when we hang on to it, like, well, um, here we don't have four seasons. We have them, but they all look the same. But when I grew up in northern Quebec, I love the snow. I love the snow, especially, I love it. And I lived on a lake and it would be frozen and I'd walk out at night and the snow would be falling thick and the sky would be black and it would be jeweled with stars and I would lie down on the ice and the snow would come down and I would want that to be, I would want it to be there forever. Mm. I desire, now if I am attached to that, The spring is going to come, the snow is going to melt, the ice on the lake is going to melt, I'm going to be swimming soon. <laughs> so we live in a world of forms and forms changed. But functions, all artists know that form follows function. Function that you can attach to function. What I really want when I'm lying there as a boy 
hoping, desiring that it never changes. What I'm really connecting with is how beautiful it is, how I feel I'm connected with an enchanted world, that my heart is excited, that I feel that I am that I'm very small and yet I matter so enormously. That's what's really going on. I don't have to let go of that. I don't ever have to let go of that. We'll never say never. At some point, maybe even that, I'll see, will give way to something even more deep. So on the surface is the fantasy. You don't hang on to a fantasy. But underneath is the fantasia that is more real. And you desire, you desire the snow to fall. And when you get a little more mature and wise, you realize, I desire the snow to fall, but what I really want is this other thing, and that's what I'm desiring. And when I expect it, when I expect when I expect the feelings that I have when the snow falls, when I expect it, I am feeding my attention to it. I'm making it real. I'm giving it time. I'm giving it energy. I'm giving it dimension. It may not show up exactly the same way. It may, but it may show up better. And that's how we make lives. We are always expecting. We are always desiring. But generally, we fall into habits. I'm talking a lot here. Well, I love it. I, I'm just thinking thought. that this can be two interviews or two videos. Okay. I'm going to finish this thought. We're always desiring and we're always expecting. You know, as we said before, even if I'm desiring not to desire, if, I, if I'm desiring not to be attached, that's a desire. And this is how we create. And this is how we create. Now, usually, we are desiring... Uh, that, let me put it different. Usually, um, we go back to what we've experienced, we, what we remember, what worked, the snow falling, what didn't work. Uh, I was disappointed. I was hurt. I was in pain. Um, I'm afraid to recreate this. So we are always creating our reality out of what we desire the most or what we fear the most. Hmm. Both of them are desires and both of them are expectations. Okay. So if I am going into a love affair and I, I desire love, a relationship, um, if I have a secret fear, or sometimes not so secret, if my fear of, oh, I'm always left, I'm always betrayed, if that energy is, has more, is being fed more than the energy of I desire uh, the connection, the joy, the company, the companionship, the opportunity to give and to receive love, whichever one is being fed more energy is the one that is going to be created. So we are always desiring. The trick of a spiritual life, of a conscious life, is to understand the energy and to understand it's easier to imagine what we've already experienced. It's just easier to imagine it. And so we imagine it. The, I, what we want to do is to, make our, to learn how to make our imaginations wilder as they were when we were very little before they got shut down because we had so many pains. We want to make them wild and juicy so that we are, and when we're imagining things and expecting things, I want to be able to catch it. Oh, wait a minute, I'm expecting a disappointment because I'm used to it. So I'm going to love that part of me. I'm not going to try and deny it. Okay. I'm going to love it. I'm going to say, you know, any little boy or little girl that had that would be afraid. I, I, I understand. I love it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love you. I love you. I love you. And the rest of me is going to feed <laughs> energy and excitement uh, to this relationship yeah. and to what it can be. It's going to feed energy and relationship to this snowy, beautiful night. And the more of me is going to take care of, okay, well, 
it's going to melt here. Oh boy, it's going to melt. But the summer is going to come, and the same feeling can come in different ways, and you'll have that. Thank you.